I am just absolutely honored to be here today, and uh, uh, I got the full-blown tour of Stigler. I, uh, we saw every single asset in this community. We walked through everybody's house. We checked the floor. Uh, Bobby and Janice did a great job showing me around, and, and uh, oh my goodness, the athletic facility, that is beautiful. That is a, uh, a great asset for you. And, and I've always been a fan of your uh, downtown area. Uh, that's uh, fantastic as well. We went out to the airport, which is a, an outstanding asset for this community also. And uh, it was good. It's been a, a good day. And I'm, I thank you so much for introducing Glenn. Where did Glenn? Oh, there he is. Oh, were you video? Or were you? Oh, everybody's there video. There you go. <laughs> um, Glenn Glass works for Oklahoma Department of Commerce, covers all of Southeast Oklahoma. I have yet to find anybody that doesn't know who he is. I think he owes money to most of the folks around here, so that's probably where a lot of those relationships come from. But uh, does a fantastic job organizing Oklahoma Southeast and events. And, and uh, Southeast Oklahoma is one of those places that uh, 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 it's hard to explain the place until you get here. And so you got to bring people in and, and meet the people. And, and see everything that we have going on, and, and uh, Glenn and Janice and everybody has just done a great job of uh, doing that. And, and I get to speak to a lot of Chamber of Commerce and Civic Clubs and that kind of thing. You can tell a lot about a community uh, by the way that events like this are held. A couple of observations. First of all, the barbecue was absolutely spectacular. Thank you so much for that honor. Who made it? Oakey Brothers. Oakey Brothers made it. That, uh, that was very well done. Uh, Love the prayer at the beginning. It, amazing to me how many don't have prayers at the beginning of events. That tells me a lot about about the community and and, uh, and, and just the camaraderie here and the different parts of, of government that are represented and, and education. Um, I, I come out of the world of local economic development. I used to do basically what Janice does and Enid. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I just kind of assume everybody always gets along in communities. There's going to be you know tough times, but, uh, uh, but there are some communities where you you got to go uh, you got to go visit to the, the city manager and then you got to go visit somebody in the county in a completely different room and then you got to go talk to the educational folks because they're not going to talk to each other and the chamber is not going to talk to anybody and uh, and so it's it's great to see the camaraderie that you have here and uh, a little bit about my background I am a small town boy I'm from Burlington Oklahoma Has anybody here ever been to Burlington Oklahoma <laughs> you have been to Burlington Oklahoma yeah. why. <laughs> Town of 124 people in northern Alfalfa County. Uh, I am a Burlington Elk graduate. Um, we had uh, I had 10 people in my graduating class. 10 people. Uh, I was the valedictorian mm -hmm. of my class. Uh, I, I like to say I'm the only one that graduated in the top 10 percent. <laughs> uh, but I love growing up there and, and uh, grew up in, on farm. We're talking about that. Uh, my folks. Still farm a little bit up there. My brother moved back to take over the farm a couple of years ago, which saves me having those hard conversations over Thanksgiving dinner every year. Grandpa's coming back to the farm, uh, so I'm thankful that Chad has moved back to do that. And, and we've been talking commodity prices and, and some of that. Uh, but I, I grew up on the tractor. My dad used to always say we uh, uh, we only had to work half days Kissling Farm from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And uh, I learned a lot during those days, and learned a lot growing up in. in rural Oklahoma. And then uh, and then I was a field rep, uh, actually for Senator Inhofe, back in the 1900s. <laughs> I did that. But we, uh, uh, I learned a lot from Senator Inhofe as well, and, and then getting to work with the George W. Bush administration. That's when I first got to really experience southeast Oklahoma, and really all of eastern Oklahoma. Y'all have trees over here. We're not used to seeing that in, in the northwest part. Uh, but I, I got to see how economic development happens differently in different parts of the state. There are some, some communities where the Chamber of Commerce takes the lead, where there's others where it's the community action agency, and somewhere it's the tribe, and somewhere it's the city, and somewhere it's the county. And everybody does things a little bit different. And, and uh, we want to make sure, Department of Commerce, that we're here to support each of our local uh, entities that are just trying to grow. Now, what I wanted to cover today, just just briefly, and then love to answer any questions. I'm assuming you probably want to leave about one o'clock. I've got three or four hours worth of stuff, so we'll we'll just 
to talk for 15, 20 minutes here, and then if you guys have any questions, please let me know. But as a, as a small town boy from Northwest Oklahoma and a former local economic developer, I've tried to take a little bit of that history to the State Department of Commerce. And, and just so you know, at the Department of Commerce, there's five things that we do. We try to recruit new businesses to Oklahoma. We work with our existing businesses to try to help them grow. We have a world-class research division. In fact, we have the only economic research division in all of state government. <clears throat> we have a community uh, development division, which passes through things like uh, 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 CDBG dollars, CSBG, uh, Head Start, uh, there's uh, the, the community action agencies and, and COGS, we partner very closely with them, but we, we do a lot with preparation of communities for growth. And then we also have the state workforce office at the Department of Commerce. So those are the five things uh, that we do. But whenever, uh, and I came in with the state administration, I'm the appointee of his at the, uh, uh, voted on by the Senate. And in those three and a half years now, um, there's, we've implemented a new strategic plan for the state on economic growth. And it's, and it's working right now. If you look at some of the numbers, we're at 2.9% unemployment rate. We catapulted out of the, uh, out of the, the pandemic compared to the other states. In fact, in June of last year, we made it into the top 10 of unemployment rate and basically stayed there uh, ever since, which means our businesses in Oklahoma are doing a better job of keeping our citizens employed than the businesses in other states are doing. And I like to think it has to do with this environment that we have here in Oklahoma. Um, we also have a $2.8 billion savings account right now in Oklahoma. And here's the big number, and if you fall asleep during the rest of this, it's fine. Uh, but here's, I think, the most fascinating <coughs> thing to me is that <clears throat> since April 1st of 2020, which is basically the beginning of the pandemic, Oklahoma is the 11th fastest growing population state in the nation. Not percentage increase, but total number of people that have migrated from other states or internationally to, to Oklahoma. It's right at 30,000 people. And, and during the 10 years of 2010 to 2020, we increased, we, we outpaced most states in our region and we increased by 200,000 people. But since the beginning of the pandemic, we've already grown by over 30,000 people. Um, and, uh, and I'll go into some of that here in just a little bit, but that we are bundling up this thing called freedom here in the middle of the United States and we're selling it. And, and, uh, and people are buying it. Most of our folks are coming in from California. Um, second would be Texas. Uh, we've had a very active campaign in Chicago and in Colorado. Uh, we're about to kick off a new talent attraction campaign in Washington State. And so people are coming here. They want to be part of what y'all are, are doing. But uh, a couple of things. We have six parts, and that sounds like a very long speech, but I'll go through them very quickly. But there's six parts to our state strategic plan, and it it fits, I think, very closely with what we need to do in local communities to try to grow as well. The first thing that we have to do for any kind of economic growth, whether it's in the state level or from the local level, is you have to have a consistent brand. You have to know what you're selling. So in Stigler, if somebody asks you, you if you travel to Dallas, you travel to Tulsa, you travel to where? Fort Smith. And somebody asks you, where are you from? Well, I'm from Stigler. Well, tell me about Stigler. What, what's big about Stigler? <coughs> Stigler, um, you probably all answer a little bit different, or maybe maybe you do have a consistent uh, message here. But what what is it that you're trying to sell? Right? What are you trying to uh, have your 2,800 uh, citizens say about your community? Because they're your best ambassadors. And I know whenever I first got to Enid, I couldn't wait to tell everybody about the community of Enid. And I was fired up about it. I was kind of from the area anyway. Burlington's a suburb. Use that word about an hour outside of town, and uh, and so I went out and I bought this quarter page ad in Oklahoma Today magazine, and it was beautiful. I spent a month putting it together and beautiful pictures and you know, fonts and all this stuff. And, uh, and the magazine comes and falls down my desk. I open it up and look through it. Beautiful, perfect location in the magazine. We're going to tell the story about Enid, Oklahoma. And I thought, well, I'll flip a couple pages over and see who else is advertising. Well, three pages later, and I'm the Economic Development Office, three pages later, the Chamber of Commerce had an ad in the same magazine, an eighth page ad. And then four pages after that, the, the Enid Main Street program had an eighth, an eighth page ad, kind of on a sliver along the side. 
And I thought, it didn't even look like we were in the same area code. It looked like we were three completely different cities. And so we tried to get everybody together. And uh, we assembled around a table, probably had barbecue, and decided we should pool our resources. We could, we could buy a full page ad and, and have a much bigger impact with our callers. Well, uh, then we decided to put together the ad, and that's when things fell apart. Because then we're trying to figure out what are we selling. And the Main Street, they wanted to sell retail downtown. The economic development, I wanted primary jobs and you know, chickens and chasing the smokestacks and that kind of thing. The, the chamber wanted retail things. And the city just wanted people that were going to pay sales tax. And, uh, uh, and so we spent two years as a community going through a complete rebranding effort and trying to figure out who we were. Because we're trying to sell Vance Air Force Base and Wildcatters Roof, uh, mining for oil and gas and agriculture and grain storage and all the entrepreneurial spirit. And we landed on a word called adventurous. And you don't see it in any of the marketing out of that community, but it, it drove the message that we would share from our community. And so uh, uh, if you're going to have a picture of something in an ad, you don't have somebody just sipping tea in the corner of a coffee shop. Not with adventurous. You're going to have them on rollerblades and they're running down the street or something. You're going to have a Vance pilot with hair on fire on Mach 1. Uh, that's, that's the story that you want to tell. Well, we've taken that to the state of Oklahoma now, and, and uh, Lieutenant Governor Pinnell was actually our Secretary of Branding. The only one state history, only one I've ever heard of. I've never heard of a Secretary of Branding. Uh, but he led our effort to rebrand the state, and now we've got logos. All 150-some agencies in state government all have the same logo. All of our websites are being migrated over to have the same look. So at least whenever you're online, it looks like you're dealing with the same state if you're with commerce or tourism or Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, the word that we came up with is imagine because uh, this is, I truly believe Oklahoma is the best place on the planet to have a good idea and make money off of it. Um, other people can tell you it's the greatest place in the world to raise a family, whatever you can imagine can make happen here, the sky's the limit in, in Oklahoma. It's one of the more powerful words in the English language anyway. So now we have a, a brand, we have a message. Um, now it's time to go tell that story, and that's what we've been doing over the last couple of years. So I, I would encourage you, uh, make sure that you've got that consistent brand here within the community. Second thing in growing an economy is you have got to have, you've got to take care of your own first. Um, take care of those legacy companies. Those that are represented here in, in, this, uh, in this room would be a great example of that. And, and uh, we learned a lot about this during the pandemic. If you don't remember, I was at that uh, Utah Jazz game where the, uh, Rudy Gobert tested positive playing against the Thunder down in Oklahoma City. I, I, this is how smart Brent Kissling is. Uh, I actually took the governor to that game, and we had a seat for him on the front row because that was just whenever the pandemic was starting. And I wanted him on national TV saying, yes, we're in Oklahoma, we're still going to ball games." And then, like right before tip-off, they shut the whole thing down. Uh, so it showed how smart I was. But, uh, uh, but I, I was there, I got to see it. Whenever we all shut everything down, the Department of Commerce was in charge of all of that. Uh, for that first week, some of the hardest conversations I think I ever had uh, was with some of those uh, small businesses, uh, hairdressers, dog groomers and vape shops. And I remember talking to several of those and, and uh, this is your livelihood, but we didn't know what we were dealing with during that time. But I do know that we had one day's worth of PPE on hand in Oklahoma, uh, personal protective equipment, <coughs> masks, and we didn't know about that kind of stuff. And so we created a, a directory of everybody in Oklahoma that made PPE that we knew of. We had 60 companies about on that first list. It took us about a week to put it together. And we handed it to our Department of Health. and said, if you're going to be buying stuff because it's spending millions of dollars, let's try to spend it here in Oklahoma. And it, it worked fairly well. Um, we did some grants to some businesses that could pivot and start making PPE for us. Some of our money that we typically would use to attract companies uh, we used it to convert some of those to keep our citizens employed. And then as everything started opening up in June again, we took that same directory and turned it, turned it outward. And so churches and camps and anybody that was needing to reopen that needed to buy masks and that kind of thing, they could, uh, they could do that. Well, uh, uh, then we, as we get a little further down the line, we thought, well, 
this is working so well. Why don't we do this with all industries? Why don't you do this with oil and gas manufacturing and aerospace and some of these other uh, uh, industries? Uh, so we thought we would just create this digital platform or just go buy something off the shelf. And, and, uh, and nobody had anything like this. And so we created our own. And it's, uh, it's out on the street today. It's called Connect Oklahoma. Over 4,000 Oklahoma manufacturers are a part of this thing. Um, it's it's kind of like a, like a <coughs> tender for manufacturers, <laughs> farmers or whatever you use. But it's it's a great place for our manufacturers to shorten their supply chain and find out what is actually made here within the state. And and, uh, and the little grant program, there's a little grant program that we we started uh, to help some of them pivot. Well, we maintain that as well. We do it every year. It's called our uh, Oklahoma <coughs> Expansion Incentive Program. I call them innovation grants. But they're $150,000 grants that we do to about 120 manufacturers every year to help them come up with new ideas. You, you've got a new idea and you just need a little bit of capital or something to, uh, to get it across the finish line, buy a new piece of equipment or, or uh, some kind of digital platform. Uh, we want to partner with you. And so we've done three years of that. We just finished uh, this year. We want to make sure uh, everybody in Stigler is aware of it uh, for next year. It'll probably be in March, April of next year. Uh, Glenn it can be a great resource for you uh, as you go through that process. But it's important to take care of our own. That's how you build an economy is taking care of your own. And this year, uh, we've had a huge number of, of wins on projects that we work through Commerce. 70% of those projects that we've gotten across the finish line our existing companies that were growing here within the state. So that's where we spend most of our time. The third thing that you have to do is if you are going to bring in somebody new, it needs to be targeted. It needs to be targeted towards the industry. And, and we do very well on this in Oklahoma. Um, I, and I can give you two examples. Some of you have heard me probably say this before. But we, we did this in Oklahoma with wind energy in about 2009. We decided we're going to go all in on renewable energy. Uh, we created a bunch of new incentive programs, hired a whole hallway of folks to focus on wind energy, and uh, it went from basically zero in the state to now we're the second largest wind energy production state in the nation. Uh, we don't have the incentives anymore. We don't have uh, any of the staff anymore. But, but we focused on that industry problem. And we did the same thing with aerospace uh, probably about 2013, 2014. Uh, created a whole slew of new incentive programs to bring in uh, aerospace companies. And we still had, we had Tinker Air Force Base, which is the largest Air Force MRO in the world. And then you had American Airlines in Tulsa, that's the largest commercial MRO, maintenance repair and overhaul operation. So it fixed the airplane. Two largest in the world. And uh, we decided as a state, we're going to bring in everybody that makes parts. Why in the world are we doing all these contracts with folks on the coast to make parts? To go on these airplanes, we should bring them in here close. And uh, and and now that aerospace is our second largest employer, they're our fastest growing. We have focused really hard, Department of Commerce, on trying to get more of the Tinker contracts left here in Oklahoma, billions of dollars that still leave the state. Uh, in the last two years, we've done 644 million additional dollars of contracts for Tinker to Oklahoma companies, and we think there's there's still a lot of growth area there. But now we're trying to look at okay, what are what are the next things we need to focus on? Um, automotive is a big one for our state. We were talking uh, some of the, the changes in the automotive industry right now, and, and uh, a lot of a lot of the companies are converting over to electric vehicles. And when you have that big of a change within the industry, oh, I can't do I'm so sorry. I can't do <laughs> Uh, when you have that big of a change going on in an industry like what we do with propulsion uh, right now over the next 10, 15, 20 years, it allows for, uh, it allows for a lot of new startups to come into the, the business, um, but it also means a lot of our original manufacturers are needing to retool and rethink the way they make a, a car. Uh, making an electric vehicle is much different than making a uh, uh, unleaded gas. Car. Uh, it's more like making a computer that's going to roll on, on wheels. And so that's opened up states like us to be able to attract that industry. And plus, a lot of those same companies that make auto parts also make parts for airplanes. And so we already have some of those relationships. Um, 
We also have the pharmaceutical industry. Pharmaceutical manufacturing is big. We're, we're actually one of the top three states in the nation for research on molecules that are gonna make you feel better and, and uh, heal you of things. Uh, between OSU Health Science Center, OU Medicine, Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, uh, and we've even had some interest out in this area of the state tied in with uh, uh, Fayetteville and University of Arkansas on taking some of those molecules and instead of sending them to either the coast or in most cases they go to India or uh, uh, you know, somewhere South Asia in order to be turned into into a drug. Let's do it here in, in Middle America. And, uh, we think that's a, a huge growth area for us. And then I would have never thought in a million years that I would be uh, the administrator over the Oklahoma Film Office. Um, I have gotten to know several movie stars in the last couple of years, and they are not all that exciting, really. <laughs> it is a very interesting industry that's growing exponentially in the state. We were the only state that allowed movies to continue to film the entire time during the pandemic. And so in 2020, we had 37 movies that were filmed in Oklahoma. Normally we have like two or three. 37 filmed here, and uh, now we have six certified sound stages. And uh, uh, we, we used to have an incentive of about $4 million a year. Uh, this year we had an incentive of $30 million that we put toward the industry, and, and we had $70 million worth of requests. So there is a huge uh, number of films that are still on the here to the state. So you gotta have a consistent brand. You have to be uh, taking care of your own. You have to have targeted recruitment. Fourth thing you have to have is a workforce. And any of you who are trying to trying to hire people right now, you know that that is a tough, tough deal. I think Bobby said that was probably the theme of our tour today was, this company's doing great, but uh, <clears throat> they got 30 employees, but they, could, they would have 50 if they could find the people. And they got 80 employees, they'd have 100 if, if they could find the people. That is, that, that's not just a stickler thing. It's really not even just an Oklahoma thing. Uh, but, uh, uh, but it certainly is statewide right now. There's, there's two parts to this to this issue, to this challenge that we're trying to, to look at the Department of Commerce. One is that some people think, erroneously, that uh, we are paying people to sit on couches in Oklahoma, and that's not true. 2.9% unemployment rate, we are actually paying out less in unemployment payments, way less than what we did pre-pandemic. Um, we're almost at what you would consider full employment when it comes to unemployment uh, payments. But, one area that we fail miserably at in our state is something called labor force participation rate. This is the total percentage of people over the age of 16 that are not incarcerated that are in the workforce. And uh, that number in Oklahoma is about 60.8%. And you have to put the point in there because it's, it's pretty tight. The national average is about 63%. So we're, we're uh, maybe two percentage points off of the national average. If we could get our labor force participation rate up to the national average, that'd be another 40,000 people in our workforce, and that would solve a lot of the problems that we have with, with hiring people right now. So I mentioned we have a research division. So we've been researching. Well, how in the world do we do this? Where, where's everybody at? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, we are way above the av uh, national average on percentage of people that are ill and disabled. So uh, we have... Uh, Obesity issues, diabetes issues, anytime somebody's talking about we need wellness programs, and that's a workforce deal because we have a lot of people that are sitting on the sideline because they're ill and disabled. We have a higher than the national average percentage of folks that are retired. Um, that's probably because we are a more aging population in Oklahoma than, than others, but that, that is a percentage that is higher. But it's, it's also something we can look at. Are there ways that we can operate where we can allow folks to be in the workforce a little bit longer, uh, that would be one. The third one is probably something we can address more quickly. Uh, we, have, we are way above the national average on people that say they have responsibilities at home. So think of a stay-at-home mom. Think of uh, folks that are at home taking care of the aging parent. Um, of, of all of the sectors that have come out of the pandemic, uh, employment is well beyond most of where we were at pre-pandemic. The two areas that we are still way behind are uh, child care workers and nursing home, uh, folks who work in nursing homes. 
Uh, and those are, are two areas where it, it's, it's creating a bottleneck there of folks that can actually utilize those services and then that keeps people out of the workforce for us. So, so that, that's one part of workforce for us. The other part though is uh, uh, we just need to attract more people. Now, like I said, we're, we've been pretty successful at that. Uh, your, your fastest out migration states right now are California, Illinois, and New York. And, uh, and, and yes, we put up billboards all over California in uh, the fall of 2020. Uh, we had the uh, slogan, uh, leave the coast to find the most. Uh, we actually have a website, ca.ok.com. You can compare the price of your home in California to here, price of utilities, some of those things. And then we did the same thing in Illinois, we did the same thing in Colorado. Uh, we're attracting a lot of folks right now, but uh, we would like to ramp that up even more. We think uh, uh, we think that's that's a growth area for us. Hopefully, it happens. The next thing you got to do is uh, you have to have a culture of innovation. As a small town boy in Burlington, you know, I noticed that while we were driving around today, most of your major employers are businesses that started here. Uh, I mean, you've got the the. Cowboys Boys and the uh, uh, Choctaw Nation, so that your, your private employers, most of them are going to be businesses that started in your local community. I, when you grew up in Burlington and become director of commerce, everybody wants to ask you, how do you fix your rural Oklahoma? And there's no silver bullet on it, but that's about as close as you can get, is you have to have strong entrepreneurship programs. A lot of times those are tied in with a career tech system, with some kind of educational system. Um, what we've tried to do on the state level is uh, uh, make sure that we've got capital in place to support businesses that start. Most of the time, you're going to be uh, supporting those businesses through your bank, um, and you've got an equity requirement on that. Uh, we started some, some rural equity programs to, to help. So you got to have a culture of innovation. And then the last thing, and we'll open up for some questions, is uh, you have to have every community aggressively trying to grow within the state. And, and I say that quite a bit around the state and uh, kind of chuckle or do not really want to grow. No, there are, there are some communities that, that don't want to grow. And, uh, and I've been impressed with Stigler here today that, uh, that you're investing in yourself. When you invest in things like, uh, like a sports facility, that's how you get record sales tax numbers. Um, I, I may step on people's toes here, but I, I also will tell you that uh, uh, whenever I started in Enid, we had not passed a school bond issue in over 54 years, and there is no way in the world to build a local economy if you don't have class, uh, classy school buildings even for folks to walk. Nobody's going to come to town with small children to walk through school and uh, and see bricks falling off and think, oh yeah, I want to be in a place like that. So. Uh, your school looks beautiful from the outside. I don't know what it looks like on the inside, but I, I do know that those types of investments are very, very important uh, for growing the community. You've, uh, uh, you, you've done some amazing things here. We would love to partner with you at the Department of Commerce to help you grow even more. And, and the final thing that I'll mention is, uh, is the why. Why do we do things like Why do we do economic development? Why is there a Department of Commerce? Why is there a Chamber of Commerce? Why would the city put your tax dollars into things that are not uh, potholes. Why would, why would we do things like that? Why do we, why do we concern ourselves? And, and uh, I know it's kind of back to school time. Uh, next Monday is my wife and I's last first day of school. Our youngest daughter is going to be a senior at Oklahoma State University. She starts next Monday. Uh, praise God, hallelujah. There's no more tuition <laughs> payments or anything like that. Uh, but we have a tradition Every year, first day of school, we go to breakfast together, my wife and I. It comes from, it comes from the very first year when we took our youngest to kindergarten, and my wife was bawling her eyes out. And uh, so I took her to this Greasy Spoon restaurant in Enid, and, and uh, we had breakfast. And so we've done it every year. So this is our last year. We are decided last year uh, to do it. But we've been fortunate. Our oldest one lives in Benita. Uh, our youngest, pretty sure she's probably going to be in Oklahoma City after she graduates. Um, all of my wife's family lives here in Oklahoma. All of my family, my brothers and sisters all live here in Oklahoma. They've been able to find opportunities here. That's why we do economic development. We don't try to invest in things like this just, just so we have a million dollars more in uh, sales tax dollars. We don't do it just so somebody gets rich or somebody doesn't get rich. You do economic development, the reason you try to build up a community 
is so you at least have opportunities for that next generation to stay closer to home. Because I don't want to have to fly to Chicago or Atlanta or Dubai to spoil grandkids someday. I don't think anybody does. So that's why we do it. And if that's your motivation, it makes it pretty easy to get involved in things like this. So I've gone past time. I'm so sorry, Janice. But uh, if, if anybody have any questions? I, I just spoke a lot longer. Well, it has absolutely been an honor to be here today. I can't wait to come back to Stigler again and, uh, and see how things continue to grow. And, and uh, congratulations on doing a great job. Thank you. Stigler tomorrow from 10 to 12 if you want to come check it out. It's really cool. I got to see it last month in Colgate. Um, yeah, so y'all come see. We're growing and doing great things in Flagrate. Okay. Now I know I have inter awesome. I've been introducing Penny as the new director of the Lake Ufala Association. She's been there a year so I can't call her new anymore. <laughs> But she has exciting news. Do you want to share the building news with our group? So um, the Lake Ufala Association is getting a new home. It's been 20 years in the making, uh, but we have property that's just outside of Lowe's, just off of uh, Highway 69, coming into uh, Ufala, and we've broken ground. We're about ready to pour the slab and expecting to be in there in between Thanksgiving and Christmas. It's going to be the best Christmas present I've ever had. So we're going to have a nice new office and tourist information center. Um, that will be phase one, and it will also be a part of the multicultural center. So keep in mind that we represent Haskell County. Haskell County is a part of the five counties that the Lake Ufala Association represents. So uh, we represent you guys, and we talk about you guys, and we talk about what's happening in Stigler, and we send people your way. Um, something else that we're having real quick on September 12th from 10 to 12, um, we're having a promoting your business on a shoestring budget training class. It's going to be from 10 to 12. It's free for all of our members and only $25 for non-members. Um, and we're going to give you some tips and tricks on how to promote your business, um, ways you can do it for free, ways you can do it uh, with just a limited budget. It's not going to be about just per hey, become a member and buy advertising from the Lake Ufala Association. It's going to be things that you can apply to your small businesses here in this area. So we'd love to have any of you. If you need any information, uh, please reach out to me. Or if you get in touch with Janice, she's on our board, and uh, she can point you in the right direction as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And we, we have a new employee in her office. And the reason I want to introduce her, her name is Loretta. And shortly we will begin we will begin selling ads for the Lake Ufala Guide 2023. So you may see her or you may see Loretta calling on your businesses and asking you to purchase an ad. So well 
Welcome aboard, Loretta. Thanks so much. And, and make sure you take your core camper that Janice gave to everybody. This is part of one of our publications that we do in the summer, uh, along with the Board of Engineers. And we have a Haskell County shop. Welcome to Haskell County <coughs> ad on page seven in the magazine. So we're proud of that. Let's you think we're not we need something else? Uh, Steve, you, anything going on with the Department of Defense uh, McAllister group? No, I'll tell you, I, I, I talked to Janice. Um, we have a colonel. They do two-year tours at, at MACAP, and I want to have him to come over. And so we're trying to find a day on the calendar to have Colonel Hammond come over. I don't know that we've ever had a, the commander of the base over here at this now, function. We've had representatives yeah. here, yeah. but since I've been involved, we've never had the so he wants to get out. We had him to Rotary McAllister last week, so I want to get him over here and let you guys listen from he's the only uh, uniformed officer, the only one military officer on that on that depot. And uh, uh, he's probably one of the more active ones I've been familiar with since we've had the association over there. So okay, we'll try to work something out, Chance, with you. Yes. Uh, I want to thank everyone that worked to help us with the backpack program. And we, we get grants from Kutzen Hills, we got grants from uh, Walmart, and uh, was it Home Base? Oh, my but anyway, we had a lot of people that supplied grants and supplies for that, and we appreciate it very much. Uh, great. Anything going on at the court? It's busy. They're busy, busy, busy. They need something to ship out. So if you can, if you've got a business where you need to ship something out on a barge, get a hold of the green. <laughs> so. we're, uh, we're going to get to it. Uh, I was <laughs> waiting for you to say see you later. <laughs> I know Dana and and Jonathan with our small business development consulting. We're getting ready to have our uh, updated information August 26th at our consortium. But I do know she's working innovative yeah, so, agriculture. Yeah, so we are um, a part of a group in the state of Oklahoma um, that is looking for agriculture innovators. So if you have um, developed a product or you have an idea for something to move agriculture forward, um, in our area or in the state of Oklahoma, reach out to us and we'd love to visit with you about that. Also, if you have a farm, ranch, or maybe even a hobby farm or ranch and you're thinking about diversification and you want to know what funding options are out there, there will be a webinar in mid-September and you can go on our website and get the date and the details, but we're going to be talking about the USDA Value Added Producer Grant, we're going to be talking about the Oklahoma Department of Ag, Food, and Forestry. Um, Ag diversification program. So lots of discussion about ag diversification funding. And so we'll be having that in the middle of September. Yes. Um, I'm Teresa with the Board of Construction. And I just, a couple of times, the Workforce Oklahoma has been here and also representatives from Chalk Foundation. We have just had two people complete their CDL program through the through Drumright, through the Workforce program. We have two interns down in the new program down at Hugo um, that are doing a cooperation between Chalk Foundation and the Workforce Program that are in the Lineman Program. Um, that's a new program that they opened up. Previously they were in college, so it would take two to four years for them to complete their Lineman Program, and now there is a fast track like they have in other states, and they are Lineman to go into the utility program. Still longer not just their lineman certificate, completing an internship, but they're also coming out with their CDL program. So Choctaw Nation and Workforce are working with those interns to pay the nearly $16,000 that it costs to put them through the program. So currently we have two enrolled, I've got more that are signed up that are gonna be going through. And then I also have a couple of more that are either Choctaw Nation or Workforce that are in line to go into the CDL program. So they're really helping us develop more people that are not only qualified for us to drive, but also 
many of the higher paying jobs in this area do require a CDL, pro, a CDL driver's license and with the new mandates that they um, be DOT certified hours where they get their, just to even get their written permit, um, these programs are very important and we really do appreciate Choctaw Nation and the state uh, with the workforce program for providing these opportunities that were not available before. Um, and then we did actually have a driver that is one of the last ones who had his permit before uh, February 1st, actually finish his uh, CDM process on his own, but he was like the last one that we could get through. So um, there's a lot of good things that are happening with the education and with um, being able to, between the colleges and different programs that are out there to help our young men and women um, sustain good jobs that are in the area that are above minimum wage. So I just wanted to put that on. Hey, uh, I know that home based services, and I've got a little flyer here, they're getting ready to do their fifth annual fostering. So if anybody in here would put a flyer in your window and sign up for that, that is one of their uh, premier fundraisers that they use to buy Christmas gifts for the foster children. So also going on is the uh, Health and Wellness Center in September is doing a run also. So I have flyers for that. April, do you have an announcement about our young? Yes. Well, um, I just want to say um, from our superintendent, she texted and wasn't able to be here, so she wanted to say apologize for not coming for you too. But um, I wanted to recognize, first of all, Shane Timmons was recognized as Next Gen 30 yesterday. And do you want to tell a little about that, Shane? Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a surprise, but I was nominated, um, I think, by a couple people within Kaimushi. So they nominated an award um, for people that exemplify um, community service under 30, under the age of 30. So it was quite a surprise to win yesterday and that was announced. So thank you guys for um, taking me in and allowing me to serve you guys. And I really am thankful for the opportunity. Thank you. Best as yet. So. Thank you. I just want to add on, thank you for our workforce partners with that, that lineman CDL program down there. That is a kind of issue program, so we always yes. have to plug that for um, our different campuses. That's one of Shane's counterparts that had the idea of bringing that program here, and, and we have our workforce and economic development coordinators at each of our campuses, and, and they do what is needed in their communities at the time. Uh, also, on the CDL, we are partnering with uh, Central Tech from Drumright. They are basically the statewide driving academy and, and we just pulled in three semis and three trailers at our Poto campus that the first class is already full uh, for CDL training and they're planning on hosting another one of those uh, classes right after this one finishes. So a lot of opportunities out there and we appreciate you partnering with us. Yeah. Uh, Board of Construction was one of the first phone calls that they made after that first meeting when they met with the KC, uh, uh, with Choctaw Nation, with Workforce, to see if we would take interns and help with that, that partnership. And, and um, we tried to get somebody into the POTO, and it was already full. So we had two drivers already in the drum ride program, and uh, very excited that they're opening up the, the POTO camp. When, when will that photo campus class start? They, they've already, they're starting their first one is ongoing, I think. The, the first one is, has just started, and I think there is the potential enrollment. They have already are trying to schedule a second one, so um, April can give you that contact information, but just contact the photo campus. Okay. Uh, okay. I know says it's going to be in November. Uh, Blair said that her nephew was going to go, have to go all the way to Georgia to take the class, and he got into into this class. So Shane, Shane helped him. So, so we're, that, we're glad. That class is open for applications right now, that November class. Caleb, anything? 
Do you have anything? Joe. Reminded of blood drive today until 6 p.m. At the Assembly of God Church. We have, still have Stigler's My Happy Place shirts for sale. Those shirts benefit the Shop Stigler campaign. And Linus doesn't know it, but he's going to make me some buttons that say <laughs> Shop Stigler. $20 a piece. We don't have any uh, 2X left, but we have some 3X and one 4X. So if anybody wants a shirt, you can purchase today and we can also take the credit card. Yes. yes. She wore it yesterday. She was really good. I also want to mention um, a program that we're super excited to get. last year to create a CDA um, training for them and to kind of get, like you spoke about, healthcare, or not healthcare, uh, child care workers. Uh, so we are in the closing process of getting that done for health and wellness, uh, and that way we can assist them. They've been using a company out of New Jersey, and so we're glad to get them back home and save them a bunch of money in the process. So. Right. Anytime we can do, we're all about doing it. If we can't buy it in Stigler, we buy it in steak. So that's what that's what we're all about. So thank I know we've gone a little bit long, but thank you so much for coming out. If you didn't sign in, please do so. We have to make a copy of that and give it so that they know everybody that's been here. But thank you, thank you for coming and we'll see you in September.